welcome to Build. I'm Sam Thompson, and as always, we are live from London. Now, today, I'm joined by two very special guests. They're the stars of the musical Bat Out of Hell. Please put your hands together for Christina Bennington and Sharon Sexton. Woo! Hello. Hello. Thank you. Guys, before we get started, if anyone watching has any questions at all, all you have to do is tweet us at Build Series LDN, or if you're watching this on Facebook Live, just leave a comment below. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you're our neighbours, actually. You're just at the Ooh. Dominion Theatre, which I think that way, we just are. on Tottenham Court Road. And uh, Bad Out of Hell has been given a five-star rating. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Many five-star ratings across the board, as our fans will agree, right, guys? <laughs> 140 viewings yes. over there, just to let you know. Mm -hmm. They're very dedicated. We, I, th I would say Bad Out of Hell is completely indescribable. You've kind of got to see it to believe it um, in scale and in heart and love, and yeah, we're very and lucky to be a part of it. Very addictive. I can understand why people come and see it so many times, because there's so much going on. Unlike um, many other shows in the West End, we have obviously the live music, the choreography, the acting, but we also have live camera work, which happens on stage as well, and incredible special effects. So it's a bit bombastic, isn't it? And fire. Uh, and fire and water. It's dangerous. Yeah. It's 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 basically based around meatloaf hits, isn't it? But it's not about meatloaf. No, yeah. that's right. Sorry, it's Jim Steinman who wrote the music for it. So it's a lot of Jim Steinman's music. So we've got two original Jim Steinman songs in the show, and the rest of them are hits that have been made famous by Meat. And we call it Meat. <laughs> yeah, Look what? at you on those first name terms. <laughs> wow. What's so amazing that a lot of people don't know is that this music was originally intended to be a musical mm -hmm. and to be on stage, and the album oh, was actually oh, yeah. the backup plan because it didn't come to fruition. So, you know, 40 odd years down the line, it's finally come back to where it belongs. Wow. Has he, has he ever, he must have popped down to the Dominion and been like, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. If you guys, you've obviously met him then. Yeah, we yeah. did. You've met him a couple of times, yeah, but he came to see the show the first time a few months ago and he's seen us in the Dominion, which is incredible. But he also attended the launch that Christina did in London. Was it yeah, London? Well, I spent a couple of days with him in Canada, mm -hmm. yeah. actually, doing a press tour with him. And I have to say, he's one of the most humble, down to earth people ever. And you kind of go, you're such a legend. And it's such an honor to be even sat here with you. And he goes, no, no, no. I'm not a legend. I'm just a normal guy. Yeah. And I think on some levels he sort of does think that. That's a cast. classic line, isn't it? When yeah. you know you are a legend, you go, oh, I'm not a legend, but keep telling me I am a legend, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, you actually play mother and daughter as well. Yes. Which means that obviously you're not mother and daughter in real life, but you are super close, I'm guessing. Feels like we are sometimes. Yes, it does. <laughs> We, we come have. from similar family backgrounds. We're both Irish and we bonded straight away in the rehearsal process. Yeah, and it's also funny because we never met each other until day one. I think the casting for this show, considering that it was an original cast and they were looking for people to create something from scratch together, they really looked out. They found an amazing chemistry between myself and Christina and then also Rob Fowler, who plays Daddy Falco. Between the three of us, sometimes it is like a little family. Yeah, backstage, it's yeah, funny. We fight and love like a family. Yes. You're always getting in trouble over there, we aren't you? good cup Genuinely and bad yes. cup. <laughs> 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 have you ever had to tell her off? I'd be like, no! Uh, no, but it's really funny. We do tackle different things, because like, it's a really tough job when you put yourself out there emotionally. Like We're not saving lives, but we do invest an awful lot of ourselves in the shows every night. And it can be a bit of a roller coaster, because you're playing every emotion. So it's nice to actually have that family around you who will give you a slap when you need it and keep you in place. and also give you a hug when you need it so we do that for each other that's lovely yeah. and you both play lead roles in this rock musical both of which are predominantly the leads are by men how important do you think it is to have strong women roles well we fought really hard um for the importance of raven and sloan and for their relationship mm. during our rehearsal process because really hard uh, really hard yeah because it's it lucky can... that we had each other actually because we were very much on the same page from yeah. the beginning and obviously it's a very important time in the theatre industry right now um, for women standing up and saying that our stories are important and to be heard as well. And we're really grateful that our director Jay was so behind us mm -hmm. in not making this show just about the gorgeous, handsome, lovely rock star men, but also giving us a chance to um, really tell a mother and daughter story. And we've had a lot of mother and daughter uh, fans come and tell us at mm -hmm. stage door that it means a lot to them. Yeah, exactly. And I think when we were creating the parts as well, when we were creating the stories, there was a lot of input from myself and Christina kind of going, OK, no, we need to initiate the power. We need to initiate the touching. We need to initiate the, you know, and by the end of the story, our, I suppose we are the power ladies. We've taken back control kind of thing. So it's just not this story of these men running around chasing 
these women. It's kind of, we flipped it on its head a bit, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about the story. Where is it set? It's set in a future post-apocalyptic city called Obsidian. And we meet Raven on the eve of her 18th birthday. And she's been locked up in a tower all her life by her um, beautiful, loving, caring beautiful, mother loving, who wants to keep her safe. Crazy mother. Uh, <laughs> what better way? Right? And she sees a gang um, called The Lost out on the street from her window who are forever 18. They don't age. And she's always uh, kind of wanted to be a part of it. And I suppose the crux of the action begins when she finally makes it outside and begins that journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I think going on at the, the same time of that, that's the kind of Romeo and Juliet West Side Story. It's that kind of young love and that breaking free for Raven and then on the flip side of it the character I play is the mother that's watching this that kind of wants to empower her and to help her but at the same time wants to keep her safe so there's the parallel relationship between Strat and Raven who are just finding love and between Falco and Sloane who are struggling to find each other and a reason why they ever got together which was Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's very interesting, actually, um, I think, for audiences who either choose to relate to the young love, mm -hmm. like life or death storyline, or you see a marriage in, in a struggle and, and how a kid deals with that yeah, and how exactly. they're dealing with it. It's you. There's something for everyone. Uh, I'm young love. I'm definitely young love. Yes. For sure. Yeah, but it's so funny. The nice thing about it is it's bringing all of this music to people who fell in love with it 40 years ago and they're dragging their teenagers along with them to the show and the teenagers are coming out going, I want to be Raven and just rediscovering it, you know, it's cool. And the, the way the stage is set and everything going on, it definitely pushes boundaries as far as West End shows go. How does it feel to be part of that? I mean, there has never been anything like it. Mm. We like to say it's like, um, we're kind of like, a bit dangerous, like Mavericks. going like the metal on the edge of a knife in every sense, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emotionally, we're putting ourselves out there. We have this crazy set. I mean, and we're allowed to climb everything, which I don't think is very usual. And <laughs> no. Often, like, and as a also, tower, do it. Yeah, that when we got the set initially, they showed us a... Um, uh, kind of model of it and they were like this is what's going to happen and I remember thinking to myself <laughs> yeah right there's no we way we said it's gonna never going to happen off. yeah for three um, or four things we said you do. can't do that yeah. but the they stunts do. are incredible I wish we could tell you all of them but you'll have to come see it there's crashing cars flying well, birds it like, it's all <laughs> kicking off oh he's seen 140 times he knows <laughs> <laughs> Fire, as you say. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. No, it's definitely worth it's worth it's coming to see. There's nothing else like it. Definitely not. John Bosser has done like the most insane job creating a playground for us. And uh, Christina, you trained at the Guildford School of Acting in Surrey. How has that has that been useful for for shows like this? Yeah, definitely. I think something that's such a vocal and physical marathon for me, like the character of Raven, it's really important for me that I had a basis of three years of training to uh, put my body through that strain and. You know, we do this show eight times a week and it's very demanding and it's really nice to um, know that I have that bank of training behind me to make sure that I can keep going by the end of the week. That does lead me on to my next point. Um, it, eight shows a week physically must be so demanding. How do you keep up with that? Are there ever times where, where either of you are both like, I'm exhausted? Yes. Yeah, there is. But it's also, I think a lot of it is muscle memory. I don't think there was one of us who did the first thing through um, when we first rehearsed the show who didn't go, oh, oh my God, how are we going to do this? You just do it. And the audience and the energy that you get from them and the adrenaline of singing those songs every night and you, you, it's, it is kind of superhuman sometimes, some of the notes that those performers hit and some of the things our dancers and ensemble put their bodies through. But... Um, you can't describe it when you feel the buzz that's in the theatre, in the room. You just feed off it. I get it now. Yeah, no. Right. <laughs> Not even joking. I think it just becomes a lifestyle. Like, it becomes mm -hmm. your whole life. When you get handed this gift mm. of a show and of a role, I know for both of us, it's been a dream come true. And... You know, you just make the rest of your life around the show yeah. about making sure that you can do the show. You randomly walk around the supermarket yeah. just looking at things and going, Drrr, and people beside you go, what are you doing? Just checking. Because you want to look, look after every yourself. couple of yeah. hours. <laughs> I just, like, on autopilot. Yeah. Sharon, this seems like something you've always wanted to do. So you trained in Ireland. Did you know the bright lights of the West End was just for you? Um, I kind of had always set my heart on it, but when I was back in the day, there was no musical theatre courses in Ireland, so I kind of created my own. I studied in DIT for three years and did acting, and I did singing part-time. Um, and I actually, there was a lot of work in Ireland, but it's very... Um, kind of short contracts so I did bits and pieces and then I kind of gave up and went back and went you know what I really like creating work and I went back and did an MA in directing because I went 
this is kind of what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to make my own work. And as soon as I did that, doors started opening. And I went, oh, OK, well, maybe I'll just park that for a second and I'll give it one last shot. And uh, yeah, I came to London five years ago with commitments and I'm still here and I'm so grateful to be having an opportunity to create a role like this in a show in the West End. It is a bit pinch me sometimes. And it, it is a West End show. Every, like The Lion King, Aladdin, Meatloaf. Like, <laughs> like, it's, it's such a difference. It must be so fun to do. It is, and actually the music is so theatrical. And yeah. I know that Jim is a big Wagner fan, and you know this is basically a rock opera. And it feels so right to have the songs on stage. It feels um, almost more at home than yeah. a lot of things that have been made into musicals, because it hasn't been shoehorned. No. Does, it, no. does it require different vocal techniques as well? Yeah, massively it does. I mean, Christina sings a beautiful solo song, Heaven Can Wait, where I can hear you can use a lot of your classical technique and stuff. And I've got other stuff, which is very Wagner-esque, which is the beginning song, which is all very abrupt and short phrases. And then you've got these massive anthems where it's like Celine Dion, like uh, that made we that both hit get famous. To sing and it's which lovely. we go, yeah, we both get to sing that, which is incredible. Um, also moved up a tone from the original, just saying. Sorry, mom. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so like you're looking at that. That rock sound, that innocent sound, that kind of quirky, kooky sound. It's you've, it's so much fun to play. Well, talking about these kind of sounds, we've actually got a social question. Uh, you're getting yes. a lot of love. Uh, Lee Gubby Watt has asked, if you had to pick only one song that is your best song in the show, what would it be? I think for me to sing um, Heaven Can Wait is... Um, really exciting because it's extremely exposing for me. It's one of the only moments in the show where there's kind of nothing else happening and everyone's definitely watching <laughs> what I'm doing. And it goes from a very, very small, kind of almost musical theater soprano-y sound to a huge rock belt. And because I created the role, they let me put it in the key I wanted to. So of and what course, key was that? I chose a very, very demanding Dead. key, which I mean, sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I do think, why did I do this to myself? Um, but it's it's the most uh, incredible feeling of elation when you know that you've... It's kind of almost like channeling a different thing whenever you just let rip on these big notes. And for me, that's the most challenging and the most satisfying moment to sing in the show. Cheryl, mm. what about you? Um, what part of my body? Definitely. Kind of for the same reasons, because it was a solo song. I, myself, and Rob Fowler went into a room with our musical supervisor and made it a duet and fit it around our voices. And the lyric of it kind of repeats quite a lot, so we work really closely on trying to basically get an entire argument and conversation through this song, musically and acting-wise and lyrically. And it, that's really satisfying for me to sing every night, and it's a joy to sing it with Rob. It's uh, very special that it kind of feels a little bit like it's ours. Sorry, Jim. Well, <laughs> ladies, I do have just one question, and it is a song from the musical, Would You Do Anything For Love? <laughs> Anything, even that. <laughs> oh, you dirty girl. <laughs> Mommy. That's who it was. <laughs> This is your calling, isn't it? Star in a West End show is almost everybody's dream, and you are living it. How long have you wanted to? How long have you known you wanted to do this for? For me, since I've seen home videos of me um, when I was about three, wearing sunglasses, and um, doing this kind of like fake opera belty thing. Like I, I think I just always knew I, I wanted attention. Um, oh, I'm an uh, attention seeker as well. So uh, this is where I've ended up, and I'm extremely grateful to be doing something that's um, so exciting every single night. It's really wonderful. Yeah, I've been doing it since I can like talk. I really was just singing my entire life. And I used to do shows and stuff in the local theatres and school, but then a tour and production of Phantom came to um, Dublin. Um, and my parents brought me, and I was about 12, and I remember just sitting there going, whoa these people get paid to do this? Like, you can do this as a job? And that was my moment where I went, oh, no, that's it. Yeah, I'll do that. Definitely. Well, we actually have an audience question for you as well. I believe Lawrence in the front row. There he is, Lawrence. Hello. Can I just say, hearing you two talk is just fantastic. Oh, you're so uh, kind. My question is, do you think that the advent of sort of social media has taken away some of the mystery and mystique of theatre? When I was young, we used to go to the theatre or go to a concert. If you were lucky, you might be able to get an autograph at a stage door. Now we know so much about you through things like Twitter and mm. Instagram and all these sorts of things. And we, we can watch Danielle undress on Instagram, <laughs> all these sorts of things. Is that the right thing? Has it taken sort of some of the magic away? 
I completely understand the question. And I think actually what's a magical thing about social media in this day and age is that we can really connect with people and you can use it as a force for good as well. And it's up to you what you choose to put on there. I know I, I choose to make my social media quite business driven because as a kid, I would have loved to have seen some backstage glimpses into a West End show. Mm. And you'll never quite understand what it's like to be in it if you're not there, but we'd love to show you as much as we can so you can feel even more a part of our everyday journey on this adventure. So mm. I, I think actually it can be very helpful. And I know that a lot of people have reached out to me and said, um, what an amazing difference this show has made in their life and thanked me for you know the character of Raven. And I'm able to give more one-on-one -on -one advice and thanks than I would be if I just met them in a big group situation. So it means a lot to us that we can connect with people. Yeah, I agree. For that reason, it's really nice to be able to talk to people. But I also, and maybe it is a slightly generation thing as well, I'm with you a little bit on that, Lawrence. It's a fine line and I dance it very delicately. And I kind of think that's the way the world is moving now. So I kind of don't have a choice. I embrace the social media thing of it, but I do put it down quite a bit as well. Um, but I think that, like exactly what Christina said, the nice thing about it is, is being able to reach out and to connect with people but yeah it does take away depend, like you say it depends what you want to put up there do you know what I mean um but yeah I'm learning Instagram is what they call me We're teaching in Instagram -y. <laughs> because I'm slowly learning what what is the um overriding message you would say from bad out of hell I would say that it's love uh, in every form like oh well, it is. You're it's, killing me. Uh, right, yeah. but it's it's really um, love everyone, you know, love your family, so love your friends. It's that kind of carpe diem, like seize the day, live fast, die young, rock and roll, or stay 18 forever. It's all of those cliche kind of, that's why I think the music brings so many people back to that moment in their youth like when they come to see it. It is, it's just that kind of a, oh, just... Yeah, just do it. You know, like, just do when it. you just fall in love for the first time, it's like, yeah. it's life or death. It is the most important thing in the whole world. And it's about embracing that and rediscovering it if you've yeah. forgotten it. Yeah. Exactly. And nice. really quickly, for anyone who hasn't seen Bad Out of Hell, which I don't believe, I reckon everyone has in here. <laughs> for anyone who hasn't, why should they go and see it? Because it's unlike anything you will ever experience in a theatre again. And you will genuinely walk away uplifted and full of kind of a zest for life, I think. Mm -hmm, yeah, I agree. I think that it kind of reignites a passion in you, um, in anybody who has seen it. Whether or not the show is your cup of tea, you can't deny that music because it is so, as you say, gut-wrenching. It gives you goosebumps. It gets under your skin. So it's a fantastic, fantastic night out. And if you are going to come and see it, don't wait. Come and see it now in this production with the original cast and in the Dominion with all of its bells and whistles because it is incredible. You will not regret it. Well, give me a free ticket and I'll be there. Uh, guys, I'm it. so sorry. That is all we have time for. It literally flies when we have people like you on the, on the sofa. So thank you so much. Could we please put our hands together one last time for Christina and Sharon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. They are at the Dominion Theatre, but they're not going to be there long. It's up until January the 5th, so buy your tickets now. I certainly will. We're here tomorrow with SAS superhero and Middleton. He's my hero. I've been Sam Thompson. I'll see you very soon. Thank you.